before we get into the video today, I just want to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors, Gnostic TV. Gnostic TV is ancient wisdom reimagined. This is a Netflix for those who are spiritually curious and want a place to go where there is no censorship. I personally am doing a whole series on Gnostic TV called The Esoteric Explorer, where I am providing exclusive content to Gnostic. Gnostic TV is a host to all sorts of different content creators, many of whom are your old favorites. If you would like to check out Gnostic TV, there is a link down in the description box below. The United States of America is technically still considered to be a very young country. And this is a country that was founded on rebels, people that were, as we say today, counterculture. All of us here who come from or descend from the American Revolution are descendants of people who literally gave the establishment the middle finger. Being a courageous outlaw was never something to be ashamed of here in the United States. Growing up, besides the names like George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, Paul Revere, us American kids also knew names like Annie Oakley, Davy Crockett, Daniel Boone, and of course, the most famous outlaw of all, Jesse James. But before we get into it, please give this video a like and hit that subscribe button. As always, such a very, very big thank you to all of our patrons and our producers here on Esoteric Atlanta. Because here on Esoteric Atlanta, we push the boundaries of the establishment. You guys absolutely are the reason why we are able to continue to do what we do. We super, super, super appreciate you guys. And if you would like to help support this channel and help support the work on this channel, there is a link down in the description box below to our Patreon page. Welcome to Esoteric Atlanta. My name is Bryce and today we're going to be doing part one of Jesse James and the Pesor Conspiracy. You guys, I feel downright giddy doing this episode for so many, so many, so many reasons. As you guys know, me, myself, something that is not very popular, it's not a very popular opinion in today's culture, but I am a very proud American citizen. I was raised to be proud of my heritage as an American, even though I personally have a dis an ancestor that, that came from the English royal family, I was raised to believe in no monarchy as my growing up that's one thing my parents did right my parents really really enforced in my my siblings and me that being an american meant that we believed every single human being on the planet was equal and that we all had certain rights that were given to us by our creator and not by our government my parents were very 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 strong believers that a forceful government was never a good thing. And that is definitely the American way. Again, America started as what we would call today the counterculture. America started with a bunch of people who were so pissed off by the way they were treated by the British government, that they literally put tea into the harbor and <laughs> wrote what has to be the most epic breakup letter at all time, making all of our founding fathers who signed that letter, also known as the Declaration of Independence, a felon. That's right, my friends. America was founded on a bunch of felons. And I could not be prouder than that fact. It takes a lot of courage. As we see today, as most of us see today, it takes a lot of courage to push back against the establishment. And I hope that for all my friends watching who are from other countries, that you have just as much pride in your country as I do in mine. And I hope that as time goes on and as it continues to walk itself into the future, that we continue to stand in our own autonomy and our own morals and principles all over the world in that one singular belief belief that all human beings are created equal and given certain rights by our creator, 
not by our government. With that being said, as children growing up, especially for me, I was born in 1983. I hope to God children, American children, still are raised this way today. I don't know, though, because I don't have kids. I was raised to have a, a veneration and honor of all of these enigmatic American characters that came before me. People like Davy Crockett, people like Daniel Boone, people like Annie Oakley, and of course, people like Jesse James. Now, I don't know for sure because again, as an American kid, I grew up always knowing who Jesse James was. I don't actually remember a time when I first learned about Jesse James. I just always Always knew who he was. He's probably the most famous outlaw besides the founding fathers that our country has ever, ever, ever witnessed. And as I started to get into this section of the Pesor conspiracy, I realized that what is actually the thinnest chapter in Stephen Pesor's book called The Book of Daniel that we're going through is probably the most enticing. And so I decided as I was looking through the Jesse James connection to the Pesors that I probably should do a deep dive into Jesse James as well because I don't know. I don't know how my friends in other countries, I don't know if you guys know about Jesse James like I do. And so I thought, well, let's let's just dig into Jesse James. Let's give let's give everybody a brief outline of who this guy was. And y'all there's an even bigger conspiracy that revolves around Jesse James than there does around the Pesors. But before we get into it, I do want to give a bit of a timeline, like the road so far. What do we know so far about the Pesors before we get into our current part revolving Jesse James and his connection with Daniel. So if you've already been following along with us, you can skip ahead a few moments if you don't want to hear the brief up to date how we got here. Otherwise, buckle up. I'm just going to quickly give a brief overview of who allegedly the Pesors are or were according to this conspiracy. And this conspiracy has to do with the House of Bourbon. The House of Bourbon was the last ruling family of France. Um, Louis the Fourteenth was a Bourbon. We've we've talked a lot about the royal monarchies in France. I'll put some of those videos down below. Very interesting. The thing about the difference between the French royal family and like the English royal family is that the English royal family like hid their shenanigans. The French royal family put their shenanigans out on display, and that's a little bit more in line with how we hear here how we are here in the south. You know, in the south we don't hide our crazy. We put it on the front porch and give it a glass of sweet tea. That's kind of what the French royal families did as well. So we have the House of Bourbon, which of course carries a lot of really, really big names in history. Again, like Louis the Fourteenth, this was the house that set, sat on the throne with the establishment of America, according again to the official narrative. We have to look at the official narrative with this story, not the Tartarian narrative. That's a totally different narrative. But nonetheless, they were the ones that were responsible for New Orleans when it first was established as a port. Uh, then it went back and forth between the Spanish and the French. And then eventually Napoleon sold Louisiana to the United States in the early 19th century, making it a part of the said United States. But nonetheless, this conspiracy revolving around the Pesor family starts with the House of Bourbon. It starts with Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI. And as you guys probably know, they were the ones that met their date with the guillotine. As I say on almost every episode, nobody knows how to revolution like the French do. Now, at this time, the French Revolution had started right on the heels of the American Revolution. The American Revolution had started right on the heels of the Haitian Revolution. So we can say there was a collective consciousness of rebellion all over the planet. And interestingly enough, as I have stated before, for all the woo-woo people out there, astrologically, the same thing was happening astrologically at the end of the 1700s that's happening now. So think about the fury that's happening now with the us versus them, the establishment versus the peasants. Think about all that's going on, that friction that we're going through. That's what they were going through too, except for they didn't have like 
YouTube. <laughs> they didn't have, you know, cell phones like we do. They just had, you know, a guillotine. And the French really took this in stride. You know, the, the French, as I had said before in past episodes, the French, when, when the colonists threw the tea in the harbor and basically went into the American Revolution, the French came over and helped. They helped the colonists break their ties with the United Kingdom. France and the colonists were like that. We talked about that with the Marquis de Lafayette. That's why every single freaking state in this nation has either a town called Lafayette or a county called Lafayette. And once the Americans won, that energy came forward into France. And so people started rising up against the monarchy. They essentially arrested Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI, along with their two children, Maria Theresa and Louis Charles. Now, kind of dumb on Marie Antoinette and Louis XVI's part, because they literally were arrogant enough to think that they wouldn't be hurt physically because they were royals. Y'all, what? Did they not remember that a few centuries before that, like, Oliver Cromwell had the British Civil War and, like, chopped the king's head off then? Like, this has happened before, so I don't know why they were that cocky. But nonetheless, they were. But they did go into arrest. They ended up finding the people found Louis the Sixteenth and Marie Antoinette guilty of treason. So again, they met their date with the guillotine. Well, in French law, as I have said before in past episodes, in French law specifically, the crown has to be passed to the male heirs. So that's different from like English law. So even in English law at this time, and this law in England has just now recently changed, but in English law, the daughter could inherit the crown as her own sitting queen, but her brothers had to go first. So, you know, we look at like Queen Mary the uh, first, Henry Tudor's first daughter. She did not receive the crown until her little brother, Edward, had passed away, if that makes sense. So English law and French law are different this way. English law, law at this point in history would allow a woman to be on the throne if she was like the last person left. Whereas French law would not allow a woman on the throne at all. So once Louis the Sixteenth met the guillotine, he was murdered by the guillotine. His son Louis Charles, who was eight years old at the time and living in a prison, automatically became King Louis the Seventeenth. All right, even though he was imprisoned and and france was in the middle of this like revolution he technically according to the law that existed was then the king at eight years old so i will give the french this and i've said this before at this time in history children were usually not exempt from like treason charges or any other charges like theft there's a lot of cases in collectively in our earth's history where children have been for doing a crime if that makes sense which is totally bananas to me but the french again i give them i give them props for this because they kind of left marie Theresa and louis charles in this prison because they were like these are kids you know, like, we don't want Louis Charles, even though technically he now is King Louis the Seventeenth. we don't want him to be the king. But on the other hand, he's eight. He's eight. Like, this dude, this little kid, doesn't even really know what's going on. So what they did was they, the French people, the commoners, the peasants, they devised a plan. So Marie Theresa, she wasn't really a problem because again, with French law, she's not going to ever inherit the throne. If she had a son later on down the line, that might be an issue. But right now she's a kid. So that's like well into the future. So we're just going to take Marie Theresa and we're going to exile her. We're going to send her to her grandmama's house over the river and through the woods to grandmama's house we go. That was Maria Theresa because she, Maria Antoinette, their mama, was a Habsburg. And so Maria Theresa, what, Marie Theresa was sent to Vienna to live with grandmama and her aunts and her uncles. That's done. But we still have this problem with Louis Charles because, you know, he's technically King Louis the Seventeenth, but like he's eight 
and we don't really want to exile him. We kind of need to keep an eye on him because literally back in those days, like by 15 years old, 16 years old, and not that many years time, he could probably build up an army and like challenge us. And so we got to figure out what to do with Louis Charles. And so according to the mainstream narrative, what happened was they decided that they were going to adopt Louis Charles out to another family. And this family was not only going to take responsibility for raising Louis Charles, but they were going to literally brainwash him into believing that the monarchy was not a good thing. Now, don't get me wrong, my friends. I don't believe the monarchy is a good thing either. In no way, shape, on this earth do I believe that there is such thing as an elite bloodline. I think people who rule nations should be elected by the people and should have term limits. I don't think that their life is any more valuable than the guy sweeping the street on the corner over there, okay? However, I do think that the way the French went about this, this aggressiveness towards, like, trying to reprogram Louis Charles was probably a little bit harsh because, again, this is an eight-year-old kid and those were his parents. So nonetheless, the story goes, he was adopted out. He was put through this like intense training program where he learned that monarchy wasn't good. It wasn't good that he was King Louis the 17th. But then he got really, really sick and ended up passing away. And you can actually go to his grave in France today. We'll we'll go back to that when we get to the conspiracy. So that's like the literal official narrative of what happened to the Bourbons. Now we get to the juicy stuff, the legend. The legend states that once Maria Teresa went to grandmama's house and packed up and went to another country, there were a bunch of like loyalists who were royalists. They were loyal to the royal family of, of France amongst this, this huge outbreak of, of everyone getting their head chopped off in the French Revolution. They decided that they were going to smuggle louis charles out of the prison they were going to smuggle him out of the prison and raise him until he was old enough to raise an army and take the power back from this revolution that was happening so they did this by working with like the laundress the the, the, the person the woman the laundress the person in the laundry in the prison and another couple that were responsible for guarding louis charles they went and found according to the legend they went and found a cousin of Louis Charles through the Habsburg side. And this cousin was around the same age as Louis Charles, looked very much like, very much resembled Louis Charles. And this cousin was sick. And so I think this is diabolical what they did, but nonetheless, it's part of the legend, it's part of the story. What they did is they were like, you know what? This kid's going to die anyway. So what we're going to do is we're going to put him into a rocking horse. We're going to drug him so he sleeps. You know, whatever they had back then that was like Benadryl, like give them some Benadryl, knock them out, put them inside this rocking horse, and then bring the rocking horse into the prison as an innocent toy for this eight-year-old king that is being held in this prison. Once they got the rocking horse into the prison, they opened the rocking horse at, up, they pulled the cousin out, they changed clothes with Louis Charles, because Louis Charles still had on his, like, regal clothes, and put Louis Charles in peasantry clothes. They cut Louis Charles's hair, and just like the story of the orphan Annie, they stuck Louis Charles into the laundry basket, where he's hidden over the laundry, they carry him out, and thus he is now released into the hands of these men who are in support of the monarchy. Eventually, the little boy, the cousin who looked like Louis Charles is the one who gets adopted out, who ends up passing away, yada, yada, yada. Now, you might be asking, can't they just exhume the body? Well, yes, they did exhume the body of Louis Charles a long time ago because this legend is so huge. They wanted to figure out once and for all if the little boy in the grave was, in fact, Louis Charles. And so they pulled DNA from this body. Now, here's the kicker. The only DNA they were able to read was the mitochondrial DNA. The mitochondrial DNA is the DNA that you inherit from your mother's line. And the only thing that they picked up from this mitochondrial DNA was that this little boy was, in fact, related to Marie Antoinette, who was Louis Charles's mother, who was a Habsburg. However, it did not prove if this was her son 
or her nephew. Does that make sense? Like if a hundred years, okay, my mom is comes from a family of four girls or four daughters. So all of my cousins, my first cousins on my mother's side of the family, we all share the same mitochondrial DNA. So if like 200 years from now, you exhume my body and you exhume like my cousin's body and you test our DNA against like my mom, they're not going to be able to tell if I'm the daughter or if my cousin's the daughter because we have the same mitochondrial DNA. So all that was proven by this test was that this little boy was a Habsburg through the mitochondrial DNA, which gives us nothing. It literally gives us nothing. He could be Louis Charles, but he could also be the boy that the legend states he is, which was a cousin of Louis Charles through the Habsburg line. I hope that makes sense. But nonetheless, so we don't know. We, we still don't know, given, given the remains, we still have no idea whether this legend is true or not. So on with the legend, this little boy, Louis Charles, is being raised by these men who are in support of the monarchy and they're training him and they're working with him because the plan is to eventually have him claim the throne back from these peasants. He even goes off and fights in some like battles in Egypt. I mean, it's crazy. This kid had a crazy, crazy life. Now, now remember, because the Bourbons were extremely wealthy, obviously they were the kings and queens, but Louis the Sixteenth was one of the more wealthier uh, kings in Europe. But when the house, when they were arrested and taken into captivity, all of that wealth was dispersed and taken over by other people. So Louis Charles, even though he's a Dauphin or a, uh, the, the lost prince of France, and he comes from money, he himself doesn't have access to the Bourbon money. So what happens, though, is that the guy that was responsible, like his main guardian, um, ends up passing away. And he ends up le leaving Louis Charles with what would be the equivalent of about a million dollars today. Now, I've said this before. I would not turn down a million dollars. A million dollars is definitely life-changing money. However, a million dollars today is not going to last you your whole life, sadly. So, but we do know at this point, if this legend is to be believed, that Louis Charles did have some financial support. Now, he's being shuffled around to different people. He's still like a preteen at this time. And, uh-oh. Napoleon is here now, and Napoleon is going around Europe doing what Napoleon did best, Napoleon everywhere. He's just Napoleon here and Napoleon there, and he's just, oh, he is on a mission to be the grandest emperor of all. And Napoleon, allegedly, according to the story, finds out that Louis Charles is still alive. So er, we got to go find Louis Charles. Well, meanwhile, Louis Charles's guardians are like, uh-oh, Napoleon, this psychopath, knows that Louis Charles is still alive. So we got to figure something out and fast because this kid, it's not just about us protecting this kid because we've grown to love this kid. I mean, I'm sure there was some of that too, but this kid literally is the last hope, the last representation that we have of claiming back the monarchy. And so they contact King George, mad King George and his wife, Queen Charlotte, up over in London, across, you know, the English Channel. I call it a creek because I've lived in England and I've spent a lot of time in France too. And literally, like, you can see the countries. And I know, I know my European and English friends get mad at me for saying that, but y'all just have no idea. Like, our country in America is so freaking huge. We've got multiple time zones in our countries. We have huge rivers and bodies of water here. The English Channel, to me, looks nothing like a creek. Like, I used to play it in my backyard when I was a kid. So we've got this little creek that divides London from, or England from France. And the thing about it is, is that Queen Charlotte was was also a Habsburg. And so these these people who support the monarchy, like they're like they like contact George and Charlotte. They're like, we've got your cousin. Surprise, your cousin is still alive. And we've been keeping him alive. But like Napoleon now knows. So um we need to like send him to your house because we gotta send him uh, you know, over the river and through the woods and over the creek now to Aunt Charlotte's house, Aunt Lottie's house, right? So they pack up Louis Charles and they send them to him to the court of England. And 
they're kind of freaking out and i don't blame them from a very human perspective like mad king george just lost the colonies like he literally is like the laughing stock of europe these ragamuffin group of felon outlaws over in the colonies like kicked his military's ass and so he's a little bit shell-shocked by this and he's a little bit like paranoid i mean mad king george he went a little bit crazy at the end right like this definitely psychologically emotionally and mentally affected him and the last thing that king george wants is for the people of england to get it into their heads again because we've already had the english civil war with oliver cromwell you know a few decades before a few centuries before so the last thing george and charlotte want is for the english people to realize that they are harboring a refuge who is wanted by napoleon so but he's still family so they have to figure something out like what are they going to do with this kid again this the plan still the, the plan still remains the same when this kid is old enough they want him to take back the monarchy of france and so i laugh at this i think this is hysterical because we've all i say i say this in every episode but i think this is what makes this story so relatable is because we've all faked our parents signatures like all of us have done this at some point and maybe not kids today because everything's so electronic today but back in the dark ages in the late 1900s when i was born before there was an internet we faked our parents signatures all the damn time so listen this is what king george did so in the court of England, there's another guy that's there. His name is George Pesor. Now, George Pesor knew, was pretty close to the House of Bourbon because he worked for them. So George Pesor had taken, like, he had taken asylum in England. The word Pesor in French means, like, weight master. So basically, his job was a pesor. He was to weigh the gold and the silver to pay the bills of the bourbons. So he was, like, their accountant, basically. And when they were arrested, he, along with other people who worked for the bourbons, who had quite a interesting relationship with the bourbons, ran. I don't blame them. They He fled to England and took basically asylum over in England. And so George and Charlotte, Aunt Lottie and Uncle George, they decide that they are going to use George because George knows Louis Charles, right? He knows this kid. And so they devise this plan that they're going to send George and Louis Charles to America, to the newly found America. And Louis Charles is going to now become Daniel Pesor. He's going to now be George's son. However, the one little hiccup we have, and this is where I talk about the faking of the signature, is that George doesn't own King George, Uncle George, does not own the colonies anymore. It's not his country anymore. But what, what happened was, is that after the American Revolution, there were all these land grants that the, the monarchy of England had given English citizens to take to the colonies and like populate land so that they could, you know, make cotton, send it over to England. So England, you know, sugar, coffee, all that tobacco, all the stuff that England was making money off, they had given these land grants. And so when the American Revolution was finished and America was establishing, it was a fledgling country establishing itself, it decided to honor all of the land grants that had been given to people before the American Revolution, which was super cool of this new government to be like, you know what, you were already here before, you were already given this land, we're not going to kick you off, just, just keep the land. And so what Uncle George did, and Aunt Lottie did, is they created a, like, this deed of land in this tiny town in North Carolina, very close, like three hours from where I live, very close to where I live. And basically, like, backdated it to before the American Revolution, and George signed his dad's name to it. And we know it's a forgery. Like, this is legit. Like, this is part of the story that's actually legit. We know it's a forgery because Uncle George and Aunt Lottie put a county name down that did not exist until after the American Revolution. 
Oops, but whatever, it worked nonetheless. So we've got this French family that moves to this tiny town in North Carolina. It's an area of North Carolina that kind of hovers around Tennessee, South Carolina, and North Georgia, where I live. It's right, right at the kind of the edge of Appalachia. Now, a lot of people question this story, as I've said before, because we've got a French family moving into an area that's very predominantly English, um, especially when the colonies were colonies. You know, this is a very English area. And I've debunked this a lot, but I'm going to go ahead and bring it up anyway. It would have not it would not have been weird. For a French family to move to North Carolina, because most of us who are from the Deep South, myself included, are a mixture of predominantly English and French descent. The reason why we have a lot of French descent is because a lot of our ancestors who were French came to the English colonies, like settled in like what was then Charlestown, it's now Charleston because they were Huguenots, they were Protestants, and New Orleans was Catholic, and there was a huge war of religions that went on in France. It got super bloody. So a lot of a lot of us who are from the Deep South, again, myself included, are predominantly English and French. Bryce, my first name, spelled with an I, that's my mother's maiden name. That is actually Brice. It's French. The Brices were French Huguenots. My dad's mom, who is from South Georgia, her last name, as I've said many times, was Bennett. Sp said the in just like Bryce, they started saying it the English way because they lived in an Englishly dominated area. But Bennett, the way it's still spelled, is Benet. They were also French Huguenots, right? So we, all of us down here, if you're a, if you're a white person in the South, you are probably 50% French, 50% English. And that's just how it is down here. So we have these pockets of communities all over the Deep South and very, again, English areas where people spoke French. And even to the point when my mother was, my mother grew up speaking French. Like that, that existed even into the 19th century. 1900s 20th century where people were speaking both French and English even Charleston itself today has a French quarter it's not like the French quarter in New Orleans but they do have a French quarter so this is not weird especially in the early 19th century this is not strange at all and most people in this town even if they were totally English probably spoke French again because there was so much French around them and so this would not have been suspicious in the least now what gets suspicious over time with the people in this town is that Daniel Pesor out of all the Pesor kids Daniel doesn't look like him he looks nothing like the other Pesor kids he has a higher level of education than all the other Pesor kids we also see conspiracies with uh Michelle Mar uh, Nay I was about to say Michelle Mar Marshall Michelle Nay who was a big army dude from France who comes in under the name allegedly Peter Stewart name we also have legends with the pirate Jean Lafitte that there's just all these circumstances surrounding this particular family in this tiny 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 town in North Carolina that make this very suspicious now we do know that we do know we do know that Louis the 17th never made his way back to the throne of France I think what happened, if this legend is true, I think what happened is that the Aluma Shmati, the establishment, was like, you know what? Change of plans. Instead of sending him back to France, because this new country is becoming so effing powerful, and because we really want to like infiltrate this new country, we're going to keep you here under this name, and you're going to now work in the shadows. And so the Pesor family is a very wealthy family. They end up, they've ended up owning a lot of businesses. And so the conspiracy is they are kind of at the top of the pyramid, and they kind of puppet people and they are part of the Illumishmati, part of the establishment. You guys get what I'm saying. Now before we get into the new information, I just want to reiterate once again. This is all a legend. This is all a story. This is all a fun legend and a fun conspiracy to consider. I want to reiterate again that just because somebody is wealthy does not mean that they're bad. It doesn't, if the Pesor family themselves are 
bad people if i don't know if they are part of the illumishmati and or if they are part of the establishment it doesn't matter if they descended from the bourbons or not right it doesn't matter right so even if the story of louis charles is true it's not necessarily true that the pesos are bad does that make sense like they could descend from this hidden dauphin this hidden kid and not be bad themselves right they could also not descend from Louis Charles and be awfully wicked. Like the story, the story is just a drama of it all. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. What matters is people's actions. And I want to reiterate that because I think that sometimes in this like truth or world, this disclosure world, people get black and white thinking. And they start to think that anybody that has a certain last name or anybody that comes from a particular bloodline or a particular family just automatically is bad. And that is bigotry. And we're not bigots on this channel. We're not racist. We're not bigots. We practice very, we, we practice discernment and we're fair, right? We look at evidence. These conspiracies we look at are just for fun. They're just to make us think a little bit and think outside the box a little bit. Now, we do also understand that there is something called junk conspiracy. So this whole like legend of the Pesors could be nothing but junk conspiracy meant to like put us in the junk conspiracy cul-de-sac where we're going and spinning in circles, trying to figure out the truth when the real issue is happening over here. So, you know, with that being said, don't let this consume your day. This is just a fun story for us to just talk about and to consider, and that's that, right? So with that being said, let's get into the next installment of Jesse James and his connection to the Paysors. Now, before I get into Stephen Paysors' work, I just want to give you guys a brief, a brief synopsis of Jesse James' life, especially for those of you who are not Americans and perhaps don't know who Jesse James was. And um, yeah, because the way that Stephen writes it in his book definitely um reads like you would know who he is like an american like i can read it and know what he's talking about but if you're not from the united states then you might not know so let's get into jesse james so jesse james the outlaw so jesse james was born on september 5th of 1847 in clay county missouri now this area was known as little dixie because it had been settled by people from the south so missouri at this time was considered part of the wild wild west now I think of the Wild West as being more like Colorado and Utah. But at this point in history, like this was the Wild West where settlers and pioneers were starting to come out and create communities. And this area was called Little Dixie again because a lot of people had moved from the Deep South, where I'm from, up into this area. Now, for those who are not from the United States, you might not know this. You might, but you might not. Dixie is a nickname for the Deep South, all right? So again, the Deep South consists of North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, perhaps Virginia. This is like the deeper, dirty South, and we call it Dixie. There's lots of speculation as to how the South got the nickname of Dixie, but many people, including myself, believe that it originated from a, 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 a line that was drawn in 1767 by two English surveyors, Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon. And so this formed what we call in the United States, the Mason-Dixon line. This is not an actual line like that's drawn anywhere on you know the ground. It was just a, a, a landmark, a, a barrier, a border for these two surveyors before the American Revolution. And so we, most Americans, especially East Coaster Americans know about the Mason-Dixon line, know where it is. And and, you know, if you are south of the Mason-Dixon line, you're considered a Southerner. If you're north of the Mason-Dixon line, you're considered a Yankee. All right, so this is how I, one of the theories as to how the South got called Dixie from Jeremiah Dixon, who was the surveyor who took over the property, the land south of the Mason-Dixon line. Now, in 1859, a musician named Daniel Decatur Emmett composed a very famous song here in America called Dixie. Um, and this, this song paid homage to the Deep South and was very much played during the American Civil War. I cannot sing this song for you guys because I don't want to get a copyright strike, but I will definitely put a link down in the description box below to the song. The lyrics go, I wish I were in the land of cotton. Old times there are not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away to Dixieland. I wish I were in Dixie away. 
away in Dixieland where I was born, way down south in Dixie away anyway i'll link that down below it's a very famous song again i it's, i know it like the back of my hand because we grew up singing it as kids very famous song that pays homage to the deep south the land of cotton this is where a lot of cotton was grown nonetheless so that is where this area of missouri gets the name of little dixie these are people who are southerners that are moving into this area to build their own farms and start life pioneer life out here in this new part of the american west and the james family was one of these families now jesse was allegedly the middle child i say allegedly because i got a surprise for you guys i uh, will talk about it in a minute but he had an older brother named frank and a younger sister named susan now james jesse james's father is kind of interesting to me because jesse james father was kind of like this baptist dude like preacher who was seemed to be like super fundamentalist and he ended up running off to california for the gold rush and he went to california under the um assumption that he was going there to preach to the savages but something happened and like he didn't come home he like passed away out there but nonetheless he left behind his wife zarelda james and her three children frank jesse and susan jesse himself was three years old when his father left so he i guess it's fair to say he probably doesn't even didn't even remember his own biological dad well zarelda ended up remarrying twice first was to a man named benjamin sims in 1852 and then to dr reuben samuel in 1855 now with Dr. Reuben Samuel, they ended up having four more children, and the farm had six slaves on it that they that she had inherited from her husband who ran off to California for the gold rush, but they brought in more slaves with uh, Dr. Dr. Samuel and the four more children, and at this point, we're gearing up to the American Civil War. Now, because Missouri was a state that consisted of both southerners and northerners people from above the mason dixon line and people from below the mason dixon line there was a lot of friction already in missouri and in fact according to one of jesse james descendants which again we're going to get to in a minute um they kind of already been fighting for like 10 years before the official outbreak of the american civil war now there's all these stories of things that happened to the james family or the james samuels family when jesse was a young like teenager and I know I, I believe this to be true because we do know that the Union troops were very nasty to a lot of the women that were here in the South. We have a lot of stories um, down here in the South. Women were, um, I, I told you guys, I went to a private school and my elementary school was an old plantation house. This is just an example. And third, fourth, and fifth grade was in this plantation house. And it traumatized a lot of us because it was very haunted. And there we would see images of this young girl like hanging from the banister. And the, the story was that this, this house was used by the Union troops. Um, and when they got to the house, they slaughtered um, the then folk and R-A-P-E-D'd the women. And definitely, this happened all over the South, where women were being R-A-P-E-D'd by Union soldiers. They were being, it, it just, the Union, the Union was not, no, no, neither side was good in this war. Um, and there was an incident that, I'm trying to be careful what I say because of this platform, guys. Um, you guys understand that they don't like certain words. Some Union guerrilla gangs, like, came onto the farm and did horrific things, we'll say, to the James family, including Zarelda, the mother, who was pregnant at the time. And this fire, this is kind of what started the fire in Jesse James, the aggression, because at a very young age, Jesse James went off to to join these like guerrilla gangs, these these gangs that were not necessarily a part of the official Confederacy to like fight. And this is what started Jesse James and his brother Frank on this life of being an outlaw. So by 1861, again, there are now these militia groups that are everywhere that are doing shenanigans. And, and it's not just within the American Civil War. I mean, they've already been fighting each other in Missouri. Okay. And there's a lot of anger. There's a lot of hurt happening with, with both sides. And this is where, again, Frank and Jesse kind of get themselves wrapped up into. They're not with the official Confederacy, but where they're with more of these guerrilla offshoot groups 
for the Confederacy. Now, according to the research, Jesse James became known as being like a bank robber and he would rob trains and like carriages for those that don't, for those who are not American. That's kind of what he became famous for. And it, according to the research, this started for Jesse when they actually stopped a train carrying Union soldiers. Um, and so they, I, I assume that's how he kind of learned how to stop these trains. In fact, it got so bad, even after the American Civil War, it got so bad that a lot of train companies started to avoid Missouri. They would just want to go around Missouri. Now, what's interesting is that the Paysor family, which we're going to talk about the Paysors in a minute, they owned a lot of railroad companies. So just keep that in the back of your mind there. Now, again, Jesse and his brother, they, they formed this gang with these other brothers, and they would rob these banks. Um, they definitely were very much anti-establishment, and um, they got labeled as an outlaw. Like, I want to say like legally, like they were labeled as outlaws. So what this meant is that even if Jesse and Frank and these brothers that joined them, this other family that joined them were to go turn themselves in or want to stop doing it, they would have been like murdered by the state for being outlaws. After the American Civil War, the Confederacy, because the Confederacy lost the war, the official military was given a pardon by President Lincoln. But the people who were part of the guerrilla gangs were not. And so this forced Jesse to have to live a life, again, as an outlaw. And as time went on, I, I, I kind of found it kind of comical because... There were stories about how he and his gang would like rob these banks, but they wouldn't. I mean, he definitely was responsible for unaliving some people who got in his way or who he had a grudge against. But for the general public, he was not out to hurt anyone. And when they would go rob these banks, they would like put on a performance. According to the research, they would put on these like performances and kind of entertain the public, right? It kind of reminds, reminds me of like the Harlem Globetrotters. Like they put on these like performances and, and, and Jesse kind of in that time, became this enigma and this folk hero even back then and it was a man named John Edwards who worked for the Kansas City Times who developed a relationship with Jesse and so he would write all of these articles about Jesse James and his gang and he would print stories like our letters that Jesse would send him and so the media definitely hyped up Jesse James now, around this time, there was this agency called the Pinkerton Agency that I believe, according to um, Jesse, one of Jesse James' descendants, that this was kind of like a secret service before the secret service was what they are today. And their job specifically was to kind of hunt down this gang. Now, what's interesting, and again, his, his descendants get even more into the relationship that Jesse James had with, like, the governor of Missouri and these important people and they were all related to each other so it was kind of like they were like looking for jesse james but not really like you know like not really doing anything they're just kind of you know but so this pinkerton agency got involved and i'm not going to go into too much detail about what happened but it got bad um we will save that for part two which i'll tell you about in a minute um and we know that jesse james himself had tried to fake his unaliving before now, they do say that Jesse James married his first cousin, a woman named Z, uh, who was named after his mama, Zerelda. But there is now some people are a little bit skeptical of that story. Again, I'm telling you guys, the Jesse James conspiracies and legends are way more entertaining than the Pesors. Like, sorry, Pesors, but this is, I can't wait to tell you guys what part two is going to be. So just hold on, hold on, because there's so much more to the story. So who history says Jesse was married to might not be who Jesse was married to. Again, we're going to get more into that in part two. This is just the official narrative. The official narrative basically says that on April 3rd, 1882, Jesse James, 34 years old, was pew-pewed in the back of his head by one of his fellow gang members, a guy named Bob Ford, Robert Ford, and there is a movie out with Brad Pitt. Brad Pitt plays Jesse James, and Casey Affleck 
fit plays Robert Ford. It's the assassination of Jesse James with a coward, Rob Ford. That's the movie. I watched it while I was away because I was doing research into this. It is a beautifully shot movie. No matter what you feel about Brad Pitt or Hollywood or the Affleck, it is a beautifully shot. It is one of the most underrated movies. The way the cinematography shoots this movie is unbelievable. And so I would highly recommend if you're interested in historical movies that mm, are based on the official narrative <laughs> not not the maybe not the true narrative i would definitely highly suggest watching again brad pitt does play jesse james and can we i just cat casey affleck is a far superior actor to his brother just a side note and i think he did a fantastic job playing the character of robert ford now Again, there is a huge, huge legend that Jesse James faked his death. And Robert Ford and the Ford brothers actually helped him do this. And that Jesse James actually became a man named James Lafayette Courtney, which again, the Marquis de Lafayette plays into the story of the of the Pesors who end up living in Texas and he lived a very long life and for part two you guys I am in contact yay with one of the descendants of Jesse James who has written multiple books on this legend and you guys know if you've been on this channel for a while you know I love talking about stories where people fake their unaliving I find those legends and those stories to be thoroughly entertaining but it takes a lot to convince me that somebody has in fact faked their unaliving it takes a lot to make me believe I have to see a lot of evidence to make me believe that somebody has actually done this I absolutely believe at this point that Jesse James faked his unaliving and that he was James Lafayette Courtney in Texas. I absolutely believe this. This brother and sister team who are like, they're like the great, great, great grandchildren or something of Jesse James. They have done a fantastic job. They've written multiple books on, on Jesse James, his connection to the Knights of the, it's the Knights of the Golden Circle. I have it written down somewhere here. We'll get into it with the, uh, with the, with the, with the descendants but there's a lot that connects jesse james to like the knights templar there's a lot that connects jesse james to the freemasons it's wild you guys i will put some links to their books i'll go ahead and put them in the description box below you can also get them on audible so you can listen to the if you're like need to listen while you're working i'll put all that below um but i hopefully i'm going to get them on my show really soon to, to tell you guys themselves about their their great 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 grand grandfather who was potentially the um america's most famous outlaw and so that's who jesse james is so basically for my my friends overseas who might not know who jesse james he was an outlaw who robbed banks and robbed trains and lived in missouri and was very very well known at the time that he was outlawing and all that good stuff so now let's go back and look into stephen pesor's information about how jesse james connects to the pesor family but before we get into it i do want to take a moment to talk about some of our sponsors here on Esoteric Atlanta. Again, we have the great, incredible sponsorship from ASEA, which is incredible. ASEA is a supplement that helps your body rebuild itself. And of course, we are sponsored as well by Miramate and Spooky 2. So ASEA, Miramate, and Spooky 2 are all alternative health for people who, like Jesse James, didn't quite trust the establishment. So I'm going to play a brief commercial for Spooky 2, Spooky 2 and Miramate are both owned by the same company. And so for both of these companies, uh, you get 5% off any purchase you make from them. You get 5% off if you enter my name, Bryce Watson, B-R-I-C-E-W-A-T-S-O-N at checkout for both of these companies. All of that information, again, is down in the description box below. You can click immediately over to the website read anything you want about these these products we both mirror mate and spooky Two do an incredible job of customer service if you have any questions brad who's come on my channel a few times is always available to answer your questions and help you set these products up uh spooky Two and mirror mate both are based off of things like tesla technology so hold on one second before we get into the pay source connection to this jesse james conspiracy hi john echo and the spooky Two team this is Kanika here, and I'm here 
to share not just my and my partner's Spooky 2 journey. Spooky 2 has been superbly special for my partner and I am actually sitting in the Scala field. In our personal experiences, my partner and I have uh, literally gone off all our, our vitamin and multivitamin multivitamin and mineral supplements we hardly take them we used to take them to support and supplement our well-being but i've been using the daily wellness protocol and my hair has just exploded in its growth the skin's gotten uh, beautiful the dh experimental frequencies i've been experimenting with a lot of them we have such good strength in our body we don't fall ill to an extent that my partner has hay fever peter he has hay fever but this time i've started using the immune super booster and oh my god it is magic uh we recently this year purchased the remotes as well so we use our dna clipping and we put our clippings in it and uh it's just been so beautiful and profound and i have always been so i pray daily i meditate daily and i've been sitting in the scala field and meditating and praying and my psychic abilities my connection to the divine if i just want to put it in a nutshell is just increasingly becoming so potent i've been using the 12 strand dna activation as well and the dh experimental frequencies just to see how it goes and the the effects are so magnificent in our, on our physical bodies and our like um, energetic field i'm an energy healer i take clients through um quantum healing sessions while sitting in the field so that they can also i can be a clearer conduit and send these energies as well by pure quantum entanglement right and if people were to not believe this all this physical proof shows what a gem of a product this is i can't like recommend this more to anybody like so yes much love and gratitude thank you for listening and uh, i could share so much more but i'd like to wrap this up now thank you All right, you guys. Now, one more thing before we get into it. I meant to say this at the beginning, but I'll just go ahead and tell you now. On September 7th of 2024, I'm going to be teaching a workshop at Secret Garden Yoga called the Alchemy of Movement Workshop. There is limited seating. This is an in-person only workshop. So if you live in the area, the Atlanta area, please check out the information again for sacred garden it will be down in the description box below you can check if you're interested in using your body as a way to find enlightenment or to find spirituality consciousness please um if you want to come come to this workshop i will be it'll be a three-hour workshop that i'll be teaching will be i'll be giving you a manual where we get into the transverse abdominal system all the different muscle groups what is anaerobic what is aerobic what's an isometric hold what does this have to do with spirituality how does the function of the blood in the body moving the blood to the body have to do with spirituality all that good stuff so if you are interested in that the there is a link down in the description box below. Again, this is an in-person workshop, so you have to actually be in person, not on Zoom. We will potentially later on in the future be doing the same workshop on Zoom, but I need to figure out the logistics of that before I can actually offer that as a Zoom option for you guys. So anyway, let's get into the Paysor. So I'm going to read from Stephen Paysor. Again, this book will also be in the description box below, you guys. So Jesse James and his brother Frank were two of the most notorious outlaws in the Old West. They fought in the Civil War on the Confederate side and were members of Contrill's Raiders. So again, these guerrilla groups that we previously spoke about. They fought as guerrillas and were not part of an organized army. Both men were accused of committing atrocities against Yankee soldiers during the war. But the Yankee store the Yankee soldiers, they started it. They did it first. And I cannot wait for you to hear from his descendants' own words what actually happened to the James family by these Yankee soldiers. 
After the war, they teamed up with the younger brothers robbing banks, trains, and stagecoaches. Jesse James was born in Missouri in 1847. After the Civil War, he spent most of his time there, though he did rob banks and trains from Minnesota to Texas. He suffered two serious chest wounds that nearly unalived him, but he pulled through. After a failed bank robbery in Northfield, Minnesota, Jesse returned home to Missouri. According to a newspaper account, he was murdered, unalived, pew-pewed in the back of the head by Rob Ford, a member of his gang. Jesse and Frank James were recognized by the common people of the Midwest as a sort of Robin Hood. Yes, that's true. I left that out in the beginning. He often did not rob the passengers on the trains, instead confining himself to a safe. He was somewhat of a folk hero, thanks in part to his friendship with the Missouri newspaper editor. Jesse often wrote letters to the editor, which were published in the paper. Again, we spoke about that. After his death, there was a very popular song that further enhanced his reputation. Jesse James. There were many people then and now who do not believe that Jesse James was actually unalived by Bob Ford. In fact, there are many people later who claim to be the real Jesse James. It was well known that James used many aliases during his lifetime, and some of those who claim to be outlaw have the same name or some of the same aliases. So what does the outlaw, Jesse James, have to do with the pacers of Lincoln and Gaston County, North Carolina? Here's where the story gets interesting and a little more speculative. One of the aliases that Jesse James used was Claude Smith. It is believed by some that Jesse James' family was from a group that immigrated from North Carolina to Kentucky and on into Missouri. Several of those family members were named Smith. As you may recall, Jonas Pesor, son of Daniel Pesor, who allegedly was the lost Dauphin of France, was married to Harriet Smith. That, and of course, is not a connection. But there are photographs of Jesse James visiting with unnamed relatives in South Carolina in the 1870s. It seems on several occasions when it got too close for the gangs in Missouri, meaning they were going to get caught, the gang would hide out in Florida. Perhaps on his way to Florida, he stopped off to see Harriet and some of her children. Greg Pesor, retired teacher, tells of one day about 20 years ago when a woman brought an antique tintype photograph to his classroom. The image on the photo was of Jesse James visiting some unknown relatives in South Carolina. She stated that the photo had been handed down in her family for many years. But it gets even more interesting. In the early 2000s, there was an auction of historical memorabilia in Florence, Kentucky. One of the items was a flint lock that was given to Jesse James on his 15th birthday. It had an engraved inscription on it which read La Dauphin, which is French for Prince. As you recall, that was a title given to the crown Prince of France, Louis Charles. Stories claim that he came to the USA and took on the name Daniel Pesor. Daniel's son was Jonas, who married Harriet Smith. Could Harriet Smith have been one of Jesse J, a.k.a. Claude Smith's relatives? Once again, we have another coincidence concerning the French connection. Yes, you guys. So with that being said, in another, I've, I've been listening to all these like interviews with Daniel, who is uh, not this Daniel Duke, who is the descendant of Jesse James, where he talked about Jean Lafitte. Like, there is so many connections here. And the fact that, according to Daniel Duke, Jesse James took the name James L Lafayette Courtney. The Marquis de Lafayette. There's just so many connections here, guys. This is an inc crazy story with Jesse James. And I cannot wait for part two where you guys are going to get to hear from Daniel himself and maybe his sister his sister might his sister might join him too so um yeah you guys let me know your thoughts down in the description bar or down in the comment section rather below in the description box I'll have all past episodes and everything I referenced in this episode specifically as well as our sponsors um yeah let me know what you think and for my audience who's not American did you know who do you know Jesse James like is that a, is that a 
person that you learned about as a kid? I would love to know. Let me know down in the comment section below. All right, you guys, I'll talk to you soon.